things that came out of Fifi's discussions yesterday was this idea that I think the spa industry in China is showing signs of maturing. You know, I think the stat was nearly 50% of business was thought that business will get worse this year, not better. There's a number of closings, maybe outstripping the openings, uh, the costs are increasing. And so generally across the board, I think there's a sense that maybe the industry is reaching a level of maturity, which is normal, it happens all over the place. But I think the days of build it and they will come are probably a thing of the past in China. And so it's important to understand where your business is today, where you want to go in the future, and some ideas about how to get there. Now, strategies can be very complicated. They can also be very simple. Beer plus Homer equals present. Now, given the fact that um, the present we have in the US at the moment, it might actually be quite appropriate. <coughs> but what I want to do today is walk, walk through four simple steps. What is the current state of your business? Why did you get to this current state and where did you go? And those two we'll look at in conjunction because I think the why informs the where you go. And then we're going to have a couple of points on how. The what, think of it like a health check for your business. What's the current state of my business? The three basic tools that I would always look at for this are a strong, solid set of KPIs, key performance indicators. A strong PL awareness, aware of what your PL is, your profit and loss statement, and cash flow. Cash flow is something that I don't hear spoken about a lot in Spyland, and I think for any small business, as we've heard the term cash is king, and cash flow is an important thing to understand. So, a few quick tools that I would throw out in terms of KPIs. I spoke about KPIs here a couple of years ago, I think. Mean. Um, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but a few of the big ones that we talk about in hotel spas especially is the capture rate. Capture rate to me is a measure of the relevance of your spa to the guests in the hotel. I remember when I first started in this industry a few years ago, I'd go to an event like this, people would be up on stage talking about 30 40% capture rates. And at the time I looked at that and thought, well, we don't do that. And I don't think they did that either. But I think people are a lot more aware now of what a realistic capture rate is in a hotel environment. And in a hotel like this, I don't know, is the spa manager from this bar here today? No? We don't want to share it anyway. Um, <laughs> no, look, the reality is in a, in a location like this, the capture rate is probably, uh, I would almost say guaranteed, 5% or less. And to me, in terms of relevance, that means 95% of the guests in the hotel don't really care about the spa, at least don't care enough to go. So understanding what your capture rate is gives you an understanding of how relevant your business is to the guest in the hotel. The average check is another one we look at a lot in spa. You always hear hotel spas especially talking about the capture rate and the average check as their key metrics. The problem with an average check, though, is that it is just really a factor of the price of your treatment menu. It's certainly not a measure of efficiency, certainly not a measure of profitability. If you're selling treatments that are $100 for one hour and then you're selling a two hour package for $185, per hour you're making less money when you sell the $185 treatment, but your average check is high. So it can be very misleading as a KPI. This is one that I very rarely hear talked about in spas, and I think it's probably the most important. GOP path. GOP being the gross operating profit, and path being the per available treatment hour. And per available treatment hour is calculated by taking the total number of treatment beds you have, not rooms, divide, uh, multiplied by the total number of treatment hours that are, sorry, hours that your spa is open. So if you have eight treatment beds and your spa is open for 10 hours a day, your total treatment hours available is 80. And the reason that we look at GOP as opposed to net operating profit is because there's a number of things in net operating profit that you really can't control. Things like taxes, things like fees, things like depreciation will come into those calculations. So the GOP per available treatment hour is a key measure. The important thing is there's a bunch of metrics out there that you can use. What's important is that you understand what metrics are important to you in your business and that you understand what each of these KPIs tell you and more importantly, what it doesn't tell you. Because we have a tendency 
where we look at KPIs to see what we want to see. The profit and loss statement. <clears throat> not going to spend a lot of time on this. I would hope everybody in here knows what a profit and loss statement is. It kind of looks something like that. Basically, your revenue less your expenses. That's the bottom line of the thing now. But where a lot of spas fall down is that they're really good at understanding their revenue streams, not so good at understanding the expense items, the line items under the expenses category, and particularly understanding why it varies from month to month. So if you're a spa operator, you need to understand the P&L fairly intimately, and you need to go into those expense line items and understand what each one means and then track it on a monthly basis, and then understand why there's a variation this month. I was lucky when I was growing up in hotel land is I had some really smart financial controllers that I worked with who were always happy to tell me and explain to me how these expense items came in. And especially if you're running a hotel spa, the financial controller might be attributing costs to your business unit that you don't even know about. And you don't really understand why you're getting charged for those utilities. Why are you getting charged that much? Is there a meter on your spa? Has it just divided by a certain number and thrown onto your p &L? You need to understand your p intimately to understand your business. Cash is king, and cash flow is something that a lot of people that I talk to in spa land don't really have a grasp on. And it's, it's as simple as understanding what a payable is, what a receivable is. Understanding your inventory flow, your control, how much money have you got tied up in inventory? What are the payment terms that you have with your suppliers? And if you can defer a payment by an extra five or ten days, that can make a massive difference in terms of your cash flow. If you don't know what a PL is, get online and find the PL sample. There's lots of courses on how to read and analyze it. Same with the cash flow. I want to go through this really simple one just to show you why it's important. We're going to look at the first three weeks. We start at the top with $35,000 in sales. We've got a bunch of outflows that are going to total $34,985. We've only got $15 left at the end of our first week of business. And the biggest one of those is production cost, 12, just over 12 grand, payroll, and rent is 12 grand. Down at the bottom is the important bit. You see beginning cash balance and ending cash balance. So if we started with $20,000 in the bank before we started this week. We now have 15 left because we've made a little bit of profit. So we now have $20,015 left. In week two, sales are down. So we're now down to $27,500. And the expenses are kind of the same as they were before. But what's changed here is that we don't have to pay rent this month. But what we do have to pay is our credit card payment. We're a small business. We're living off our credit card. All of a sudden, that credit card payment comes due in week two, and if we don't have enough money to pay for it, we can find ourselves in a hole very quickly. And so at the end of week two, we're actually $5,000 behind in terms of our net cash flow. But remember, we started with a little over 20, so now we've still got some cash in the bank, which means if we get hit with a credit card payment, or if we get hit with a fine, or if we get hit with some major unplanned expense, We've still got that $14,000 ready to go. Then in week three, the sales have gone back up, the production cost has gone up in line with that. What's changed here is we don't have to pay rent again because we paid rent at the start of the month. We don't have to pay for the next few weeks. We don't have to pay our credit card because we've paid that off, but we do have a loan repayment that we have to kick in. And so at the end of all that, we end up a little bit further ahead and we're starting to build our cash. And the reason I went through all that is because some weeks you will have expenses that you don't have in other weeks. You pay your rent at the start of the month. Your credit card statement might come in the middle of the month. You might have an inventory payment that you have to make. And so when you're in a small business, if you don't control the cash, you don't understand how much cash is in the bank that you can spend, again, you can find yourself in a hole. And that's what cripples most small businesses. It's cash flow. It's not actually the business itself. It's just the ability to control the cash, the ins and outs. So that's the what is the current state of our business. The why and the where I always look at together. Why did we get here and where can we go? Because I think the why informs the where. The two best tools that you can use to, to work out the why and the where, in my opinion, are the SWOT analysis, which I hope we're all 
Wheeling and the Blue Ocean Strategy, which if you haven't checked out the Blue Ocean Strategy, you really must. It's a bit dark. I think everybody knows what a SWOT analysis is. You assess your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and your threats. But looking at it in this perspective, the green stuff is the good stuff, the red stuff is the bad. So your strengths and opportunities are good, the weaknesses and threats are obviously bad, but having a look at the other axis, the vertical axis, external versus internal, strengths and weaknesses are your own. Opportunities and threats are external to you. You can't control them. You can try and exploit them, but you can't control them. And so it's important when you're looking to work out what to focus on to fix your business, you focus on the things you can control. You can't control the opportunities that are out there. You can exploit them, you can chase them, but you need to focus on the things that are internal that you can control. The next level of the SWOT analysis is plotting it on a diagram like this and working out which quadrant you fall into. If you've got more factors in your business that fit into the strength and opportunity bracket, then what you need to do is develop an aggressive strategy to double down on what you've got. Because you've got a lot of strength, you've got a lot of opportunities, you've got the best hand at the table, you need to go all in. If you've got more opportunities and weaknesses, then what you need to do is think about reconfiguring your business because something's not quite right. And this is a level of analysis that you don't often see in SWOTs. We just basically do our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. But I think once you go to this level, you start to understand what type of strategy you need to be putting in place for business. If you've got a lot of strengths and a lot of threats, then you need to diversify a little bit because you've got, uh, you're exposed in some of those risk areas. So a diversification strategy is what you need. And obviously if you've got a lot of weaknesses and a lot of threats facing your business, then you need to think about a turnaround strategy because things are maybe not looking great. The thing that I always like to do with SWOT analysis, the biggest mistake people make is that they overestimate their own strengths and they underestimate the strengths of the competition. And so what I would always recommend is if you're doing it in a team, that you get the smartest person on your team to do a SWOT analysis from the perspective of your competitor. So you say to that person, you go away and do a SWOT if you were running the business of the competitor down the road. And his objective or her objective is to try and beat you in terms of showing you what they're good at versus what you're good at. <laughs> the Blue Ocean Strategy. Has anybody read the book? A few people. The Blue Ocean Shift is basically the updated version. I thought I knew what the Blue Ocean Strategy was all about. I thought it was just like, you know, there's lots of big, wide, blue skies, lots of opportunities. But what I realized when I actually read the book is you've got to understand what a red ocean is first to really understand what the point of the blue ocean is. <clears throat> a red ocean strategy is one where you're competing in an existing marketplace. You're all basically competing for the same demand, you're competing for the same guests, and you've got to find a way to differentiate your product or otherwise it just becomes a battle of cost. A price point becomes an argument about price. Whereas the blue ocean strategy is the complete opposite of that. If you're in a blue ocean, you're actually creating new demand. You're creating a new market, a new opportunity. And if I was to look at those two sides of the equation and work, work on which one the spa industry is in today, I think we'd probably agree we're in a red ocean. I think we're at a point where we're all competing for the same business now. We're all trying desperately to differentiate ourselves. We're all chasing the same customers, the same market demand. What we need to start doing is thinking about how we can create blue oceans. In fish terms, we need to go over there. The reason it's a red ocean is because everybody's just eating the same, you're all eating the same food essentially. You're all killing each other's lunch. The industry curve, or the value curve, in blue ocean strategy terms, is what this looks like. <clears throat> and this is the industry curve for the circuses. Does everybody know what Cirque du Soleil is? The fancy circus where they do all the art and stuff. The red lines here are the red ocean for the current state of the circus industry. The Ringling Brothers Circus and sort of regional circuses. The blue line 
is the surface soil area. The gap between the red line and the blue line is essentially the blue ocean, the opportunity, the unmet demand, the opportunity. So what we do is with the long the bottom axis, we identify key elements or factors or criteria of our business. In this case, you can read it there, the service has looked at price, star performance, animal shows, multiple arenas, fun and demo, all those things. So they're the key elements of the service business. On the vertical axis, again, we're basically rating them from high to low in terms of the value that they represent to the business. So if we follow the red line, you see that the, the curves are basically the same for the two types of service, Ringling Brothers being the leader and the regional services following behind. You can see at the top there, they've talked about star performers and animal shows and idol concessions being their big things. They're the things that are really important in service. People go and see the famous, um, the celebrity jugglers, the celebrity clowns, the celebrity acrobats. <clears throat> animal shows, they also go for animal shows, of course, which are expensive. Um, Art concessions, I guess, just make a lot of money for them. And multiple arenas. Ringling Brothers had a three ring service, that was their thing. What Surface Ole did is say, how can we eliminate those factors from our business model moving forward? And so, what they've done is they've eliminated star performers, they've eliminated animal shows, there's no animals. So the costs are much lower now for that business, because keeping animals in service is an expensive thing to do. Um, they've eliminated the multiple show arenas. You see, moving across, they've reduced the focus on fun and humour and thrills of nature. So they differentiate themselves a little, not a lot. And then they've added some new components to it, like the theme and the artistic beauty. But what you see there is two very different curves. And in that, they had the opportunity, and in that, they've been successful. If they had just looked at the service industry and tried to do things a little bit better, it wouldn't have worked. They looked at how they could do it honestly. So what would this kind of curve look like? Well, let's do it from a SPA perspective. Price. Price is fairly high up in terms of most parts, right? We're expensive generally. Um, facilities. Normally we've got very high facilities. If we look at something like therapists, the focus on therapists, I think, at least from a hotel's point of view, is fairly low. They're an important part of our business, but as a point of differentiation, how many of our guests or our customers really know the difference between one therapist and another in our hotel's part? Not a lot. So if we say price is high, facilities are high, and therapists are somewhere a bit lower, how can we create a model that is opposite that? Something with a low price point, something with a low focus on facilities, and something with a higher focus on therapists. In a way, that's kind of what this massage on demand business has done in places like the US and the UK. Companies like Zeal and Soup, which some of you may have heard of. I don't know if there's an equivalent in China, probably not. Fifi, do we know if there's an equivalent? <coughs> no. These companies basically bring massage to your home or to your office or to your work. And so they do it at a much lower price point than you get in the spa. They do it without all the fancy facilities because they just bring a massage table to your room. And they do it with a much higher focus on the individual therapist. So in a way, they've created a blue ocean by creating this thing that is opposite of what the spa is today. So something like this, what I would encourage you to do, and it's in the notes in the book, Try and do one of these industry curves for your industry and for your business within that industry. And identify the spaces. Now, you may not be able to go after all those spaces, but at least you can identify that that's where the opportunities are. That's in your book too. We're not going to go through that today. We don't have time. But it's a great little summary. Apart from the cartoon drawings, it's a great summary of what the Blue Ocean Strategy is. So check out the notes if you want to find out a bit more about the Blue Ocean Strategy. And again, we won't go through this today, <clears throat> but the idea is you need to eliminate some factors of the current business if you're in a red ocean, which we are, so what factors can we eliminate, what can we reduce or raise, some things we need to do less of, some things we maybe need to do more of, and then what can we create that's new to create a blue ocean. Another key element of the blue ocean is identifying your non-customers and identifying the commonalities of non-customers. What do your non-customers, the people who don't go to your spa, what do they all have in common? Uh, yes, it's 
spark customers and spark consumers. And we get the self-fulfilling prophecy, which is they tell us we're great. It's like when you do your um, your guest survey at the end of the treatment. The feedback is always fantastic, because we're great. But what we need to do is talk to the people who aren't our customers and find out why they're not coming. And when it comes to non-customers, in the Blue Ocean strategy, they have identified three levels. You've got the current market there in red, so they're your current customers. The next level out is your soon-to-be non-customers. So these are the people that have been to your spa, they've checked it out, they're, they've had enough, they're bored, they don't want to be here anymore, they're, they're leaving soon, unless you find a reason for them to stay. <coughs> then you've got the refusing customers. These are the people who know about your business, know what you've got to offer, but decide they're not coming, for whatever reason. Maybe it's price, maybe it's convenience, maybe it's the menu is confusing. Could be a bunch of reasons. And then you've got the unexplored customers. These are the people who do not even know that you exist. The smart industry spent most of their time in the early years, as most new industries do, in that third tier. People didn't know what we had to offer. That's not the case today. I think everybody expects to see a hotel like this with a spa. And they probably know what they're going to get, pretty much. So, for the spa industry today, we're sitting really between tier one and tier two. I think it's where most of our focus should be. So we've got people that are potentially going to leave, or we've got people who know what's there and just don't want to be there. What you now need to do, now that you've identified who those customers are, identify what they have in common. We talked about price. If price is a significant issue for non-customers, then if you can create something that lowers the price point, there's, there's something in common between all those people who aren't using your service now you've potentially got a new customer if you can give them a lower price point. Maybe it's convenience. Hotel spas open from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. I come back after a day of meetings, I want a massage at 12 o'clock. I don't want any panky, I just want a massage at 12 o'clock. Hotels say the spas closing at 10 for various reasons, but that's much more. So if you can have a product offering that is open from, you know, from 12 o'clock in the day till midnight, or do split shift or just open longer, You've now created a, a potential business that those non-customers will now use. So identifying the commonalities of non-customers. Find out who are not your customers and find out what they have in common. That will help inform a new product or a new service offer. And the how? This is kind of the fun bit. This is the easy bit. Partnerships and collaborations. We don't do enough of that here. And I think as an industry generally, we talk a nice story, but we're much more competitive than we are collaborative, which is why I always enjoy sitting with my dear friend and professor, because the academics of this world, their default is to collaborate. Our default is to compete, their default is to collaborate and partner. And so I think as a, as a business that needs to explore new opportunities, finding ways to partner and collaborate with people is a great way to do that. Pop-ups are a great way to do it as well. Pop-ups are a great way to get maximum exposure for minimum investment. I don't see enough pop-ups, and you should be having pop-ups inside of your spa. Imagine if you had, there's a few pop-ups, the Elmas Fast was a great idea they did in the, in the UK. Elmas used to be a sister company of ours before we all split up. They got an old double decker bus, fitted it out, put some express treatments inside, great exposure everywhere they go, just driving down the streets, it's great exposure. But what it also is, is a bit of a laboratory for them. It gives them a chance to test out new treatments, new products, new services in the bus, in a high profile exposure environment. Now that's a bit of an extreme case. So it's a lot of cost, doesn't it? I mean, I think it costs me 60,000 pounds for a bus. Um, but there's a number of different ways you can do pop-ups. Pop-ups are a great way to do it. A pop-up inside of your spa, if there is a, let's say Kate Spade had an athleisure line, I don't know if she does, you know, like yoga pants and stuff like that, if you could do a launch of her new range in your spa or in your gym, she has a pop-up, she comes and builds a pop-up inside of your spa for that two-week period, it gives her great exposure, gives your guests something new to look at, creates some treatments around it, it's a great opportunity for both people to get some exposure and for you to offer something different 
And particularly here at Hotel Spa, it gives you another story. Because hotel spas are always looking for a new story. The lean startup is something that is a, a tech thing. Has anyone heard of the lean startup? Sanford, everything. Thanks for putting your hand up, Sam. The lean startup is basically this idea, come from Silicon Valley, from all these tech startups, the idea of building a minimum viable product, getting it out to the market as quickly as you can, don't perfect it, get it out to the market as quick as you can, and then get the feedback from the market, and then learn from that, iterate, change, and then update the product, and then launch it again. Because I think what we do, especially in spas, I think we tend to say that we're the experts, the guest isn't. And so we think we know what the guest wants, and we put out what we think is the best version that we can do. What we need to be focused on more is creating new concepts, new ideas, and throwing them out there and just seeing what sticks. Literally, put it out there, launch the product, test the product, measure it, get the feedback, get the data, learn from that, then launch another version of it. We're paranoid about failing, we're paranoid about the fact that this won't succeed and people will think that was a bad idea. But people forget. People really forget. It doesn't matter. So the lean startup is another one that I recommend. Blue Ocean Strategy, you've got to get your hands on it. <clears throat> you probably need to get an illegal copy online if you want to pay for it. But it's only 15 bucks or 20 bucks, I think. Um, the lean startup is another great one that you need to get your hands on if you just pull around. <clears throat> and this one's also in your notes. We don't have time to go through it today, but it's called the Lean Strategy Canvas. But to me, it's not just Lean Strategy. To me, it's a great way to map out your entire business. If you look at the categories here, we've got the problem, the solution, the metrics we talked about, the cost structure, your revenue streams. So this really is the plan, the summary plan for your business to create a new version of what you are today or improve the current version that you have. And I think, in summary, we're talking about the what being the KPIs, your key performance indicators, your PL, your profit and loss statement, your cash flow, the why and the where comes down to a more in-depth SWOT analysis, not just the superficial stuff. Dig a bit deeper, categorize things a bit better so that you can target something a little bit more strategically. And the Blue Ocean strategy to identify the opportunities, to identify the open spaces. And the how, partnerships and collaborations all the time, pop-ups all the time. We don't, I can't remember the last time I actually saw a pop-up inside of a spa. I don't think I've ever actually seen it. And lead startup, produce it, put it out there, iterate, learn it, put it out, because we think we know it all. And this is not just for the product people in the audience, the people who create equipment, the people who create machines, it's also for the people who create treatments and concepts. And that one is just for Derek Martin, because Derek likes to be there. Thank That's you awesome. so much.